calling that we are called, excuse me, this is a, a calling that we are, are given. It's not one that we are to uh, negotiate or decide about. We are given the, the, the command to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then following that command, Paul starts talking to us about different family relationships. He says husbands and wives. Then he says um, parents and children. And now here he says slaves and masters. And that helps us to see a little bit of the difference in what he's talking about and what our historical understanding of slavery might be different. Um, so first, uh, I'd like us... Go ahead. Oh, all right. Oh, okay. Um, first, I'd like us to look at this passage with three different lenses, okay? We're going to look at the same passage three different ways. The first passage, or the first lens, rather, that I would like to suggest is the historical lens. Um, there is, uh, there has always been understanding of, of slavery. There's been slavery in the world since uh, very early history. Um, that does not necessarily mean that it's uh, good or that we should pursue it, but it is an acknowledgement that slavery has been around uh, since the ancient times. So I, I've suggested that we look at uh, slavery through the lens of uh, Old Testament or ancient understanding, through the lens of New Testament or, uh, you know, the, the uh, days of the, the scripture that's being written, and then recent history, which I would propose uh, is where our modern understanding of slavery really comes from. Now, in the Old Testament, there, is, uh, there are parameters given for slavery. Uh, the, the people of Israel have been given instructions, if you read the Old Testament, about what it means to, to be enslaved and, and to be a servant of one of their, their fellow uh, Jewish uh, uh, brothers or sisters. And we need to understand that slavery was different in that regard. Um, and it's not just in within the context of Judaism where slavery was different. We can see examples in the Old Testament where slavery was different throughout the world. For example, if you look at Abraham and uh, you see uh, his conversation with the Lord uh, when he was promised a son but hadn't yet been given one, he talks to the Lord and says, I, I have no heir. Uh, my house, uh, the possessions that I have are going to go to a slave. Now that right there should give us an indicator that slavery was understood in a different way or a different context than what we would consider it. Because uh, for our modern recent history, uh, I'm sure you with me can't imagine a situation where a slave owner would pass their possessions or make a slave their heir. Well, that was the case in the Old Testament. Slavery was, uh, it was temporary. Uh, it was clearly defined um, it was all, most often temporary. It wasn't always temporary. Um, and it was, uh, think, think the idea of an indentured servant, uh, perhaps, would be a way to understand that. Uh, someone who um, committed to working for another and was provided for, uh, uh, perhaps meagerly, but uh, was provided for food and shelter uh, for that work. In the New Testament and forward, now, please understand this is not an exhaustive understanding of the looking of slavery. This is just a very brief overview. In the New Testament and forward, we need to understand that slavery could have could be brutal and often was, but it wasn't always. Uh, we have a term in scripture that uh, helps us to see that. In the passage that I read from the English Standard Version, it used the term uh, bond servant. Now, a bond servant, I'm sure you you may have heard this before, but if you bear with me as we look over it again, a bond servant was different than a, a normal slave. A slave was someone who was um, uh, brought in or conscripted to service for a particular house. And, excuse me. Uh, a slave was someone who was brought in uh, and conscripted to work in a particular house where uh, they uh, would, would give work and be given food and shelter uh, and be a part of the family dynamics uh, there. A bond servant was someone who, even after the time where they were free, chose to render service, to continue in service to their master. 
Uh, it was a, a, a choice on their part. It was someone who decided that they would continue serving their master. There may have been many, many different reasons for that, um, but suffice it to say that this was a different level of service because of the fact that they chose to continue it. It was signified by uh, an all being put in the earlobe. Uh, often it was given, uh, you know, there was a, a place of um, participation in the family for the bond servant. Um, this is an understanding much more uh, to, to think of a, an economic class rather than um, what we think of in the, uh, in the most recent past. And then we move into recent history. Uh, this would be uh, include, obviously this would include the slave trade in the United States uh, and in the most recent years uh, where um, slavery was often racial it was dehumanizing, it was brutal. Um, that is not the slavery that is being talked about here in this Ephesians passage. Um, Chuck Swindoll, uh, a writer that I uh, have enjoyed reading over the past, makes this quote uh, that I have here at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Chuck Swindoll said, the reason most first century Christians, this is very early church, this is the, the, the time surrounding when Ephesians was written, the reason why so many first century Christians can, uh, could tolerate the uh, slavery is because in many cases it was tolerable. So this is an understanding that in history, there were different understandings for what slavery meant and what it constituted. But the focus here of Ephesians chapter six, verses five through nine, where it talks about slaves and masters is on Christian slaves and Christian masters. This is the, the imperative that is given here for uh, how they should live, because they are not just slaves or masters. They have become Christians, so they are Christian slaves or Christian masters. We have uh, instructions given to uh, slaves and masters elsewhere in Scripture, um, and we need to recognize that that is the imperative that is given here, is if we call ourselves Christians, whether we are in the category of slaves or masters, we have been given instructions on how we should live. And because it's in the context of the family relationships, uh, Paul has talked about uh, the relationship between uh, believers submitting one to another, the relationship between husbands and wives, the relationship between parents and children, and now the relationship between uh, slaves and masters, that is the context we need to understand it in, in the familial or, or household uh, dynamics. So that's historical. Next, we're going to look at it, I would suggest to you, in the modern understanding. Um, quite often, uh, when I have heard this passage preached, um, it, it uses that understanding of history, talks about how uh, slavery was more often a, uh, a dynamic of economics than it was uh, the, the brutal dehumanizing slavery that we are most familiar with. Uh, and because of the fact that it was a, an economic uh, relationship, now in today's context, we might use the word employee and boss or uh, owner, uh, employee and, uh, and manager, uh, perhaps. But that is, a, that is an acceptable understanding. I think it's an acceptable modern uh, application. And when we look at it in the modern way and we think about our jobs or our, our occupations, we have been given instructions on how we should interact. And it's important for us to recognize that each one of these family dynamics has the, the same hinge or the same pivot that we were given earlier in uh, Ephesians when it says as believers, we're called to submit one to another. We're not called to lord over another, we're called to submit to one another. And here it's emphasized again in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, when it starts talking, Paul starts talking to the masters. He says, masters, do the same to them. So he's saying the relationship that I've just described for slaves to masters should be reflected in the same way from masters to slaves. It's continuing that pivot or that submitting one to another, even in the dynamic of slaves and masters or, or employees and bosses, employees and managers. And what is the instruction given to uh, these, these folks? We are given instructions directly to slaves or to, to uh, employees. 
here in verses five to eight, where it says that we're called to serve. We're called to serve. It, it says it here in verse five, when it says, uh, let's see, your bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Obey your masters with a sincere heart. We're called to serve sincerely, and we're called as a reminder that we are going to be rewarded or, or given uh, wages for the way that we serve. It says that in verse 7, when it says, um, knowing that rendering service with a good will, uh, um, sorry, excuse me, verse 8, when it says, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. So we are called as a, an employee or as a slave, as a bond servant, to serve sincerely. Elsewhere in scripture, which we're going to look at uh, briefly later on, it, Paul says, that, were you a bond servant when you were uh, called to Christ? Then remain. Were you free? Remain. Like just that doesn't uh, impact your ability to serve Christ because we're called to serve sincerely and recognize that God will give us our reward for the, the work that we do, the work that we render. Now, as, um, as masters, and when it turns the corner here, he says we should continue uh, to um, do the same to them. But he adds this uh, two uh, injunctions where it says um, we are called as masters, excuse me, while well, I look, look this up, as masters, we're called to do the same, where, but it says to do so with careful speech, stop your threatening, and knowing that we are co-laborers, knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, that there, there is no partiality with him. So as masters or as uh, believers who are employees, we are called to remember that uh, not only should we, if we are the employer or the master, be serving sincerely and recognize that God will bring reward, we should be adding careful speech and remembering that we're co-laborers. It's important for us to remember no matter where our position on the, the hierarchy of society that we are co-laborers with our brothers and sisters in Christ. No matter if we are uh, pushing a broom or um, studying systematic theology or um, feeding the masses, we are co-laborers with each other. And as co-laborers, we should remember that that demands a certain level of respect, that we should be uh, submitting one to another, even in this dynamic of masters and slaves. So this I would call or I would propose to you as the modern understanding of this passage. But I don't think that this is the most applicable or the, the, um, the ultimate understanding of this passage uh, for us in the modern day. I would consider this, this to be where most of us should take this passage and really put it into practice in our lives. And I am going to call this uh, a theological understanding. We... Uh, while we are not comfortable with the term slaves most often or masters, we are given this understanding elsewhere in scripture. Um, and we should remember that as Christians, we are called to be slaves to God. We are, we are brought into that and that understanding of bond servant is very applicable here where we are not called to be slaves where we um, render service while um, begrudging it, we are called to render service while choosing it, choosing to render service to God, our Lord. And we see this in two uh, particular passages uh, very, very well. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21 to 23, Paul is talking here again uh, to the Corinthian church, and he says this, were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. 
So Paul here is calling our attention to the fact that when we came to Christ, what we are, what we are doing is we are giving ourselves to the Lord and saying, Lord, we are yours. Our life is yours. We are, uh, we are taking our will and our um, ultimate, uh, what we think of as ultimate planning of our life, and we're placing it in your hands on your altar, and we're saying, God, you direct us. You call us where to go. You tell us where uh, to, to be. You tell us what to say. You tell us what we should do. We are giving ourselves to you. We are being becoming bond servants to Jesus, our Lord. That's what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 21 to 23. And again, in Romans chapter 6, a passage in scripture where uh, I think we, we would do well to um, put into our hearts and minds. It's the passage where uh, we are told that we should reckon ourselves as dead to sin. We should consider ourselves as, uh, as dead to uh, our past uh, predilection, uh, predilections where we, we, were, we were tempted this way or we wanted to go this way or, or we, we failed in this way. We should consider ourselves as dead to sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus our Lord. But in verse 19, it uses this imagery of slavery again, and it says, um, consider ourselves as slaves to righteousness as slaves to righteousness. We're called to uh, call ourselves, we're called to uh, make ourselves uh, a servant of righteousness, a, a servant of the things of God. It uses the, the contrast there where it says in the past we were uh, slaves to sin and unrighteousness, but as Christians we are called to become slaves of righteousness. In verse 19, it says this, I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. And then he continues, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time? from the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We've been given this understanding or this relationship with God where we should remember that even though we uh, were born free, um, when we came to our relationship with God, we enter into a bond servant relationship with him, where we say, Lord, our life is yours now. And we should be submitting to what he calls us to do. Our life is not our own. Um, uh, we just sang, uh, I can, how strange, how divine, I can sing all is mine, yet not I through Christ, uh, yet, but through Christ in me. Um, we, we have access to all of this, as, as David read from Ephesians chapter one, he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly realms. And, and we have access to that because, not of ourselves, but because of Christ, our Lord. And he calls us and leads us. And we need to recall, remember that as bond servants, our job is to follow. Now, one of the key ingredients of understanding uh, the relationship of slaves and masters is that um, the uh, ability to tolerate or to understand it as uh, reasonable is a reflection of who the master is. And so as Christians, when we say we are bond servants or slaves to God, we are giving ourselves to the best master, the master who has our best at heart, who wants us to become uh, the, the, the man or woman that he has called us to be. And not only does he want us to become that, he has equipped us with everything we need so that we may become that. And when we follow him, we will continue to grow in our understanding of who he is and in our reflection of who he has called us to be.
So as we look at these two, uh, these uh, four verses, Ephesians chapter six, uh, five to nine, we need to think about these questions. If you are, uh, if you would qualify yourself as primarily an employee uh, or a worker uh, as a as a Christian, then uh, this first question here is for you: Am I serving Christ in my working? In my work, am I serving Christ? Whatever that work is, if I'm a teacher, if I am a uh, if I am uh, a chef, if I am a librarian, if I am uh, uh, a person who um, sells vacuums, whatever it is uh, that I do in my work, am I serving Christ? Elsewhere in Colossians chapter three, we're given this reminder again, just as he did in Ephesians chapter six, that when we work, we need to render that service as to the Lord. We're not working primarily for the employee, uh, or for the, the boss that we have in our job. We're not working primarily for the customer that we're, we're serving. Primarily as Christians, we are working and called to remember that our work is to be service rendered unto the Lord. So because of who Christ is to me and in my life, is that reflected in my work? And when I say in my work, I, I primarily in these three areas, and these are the areas that I consistently uh, need to ask the Lord to help refine me in, in my attitude. Not just what I'm doing, but how I am doing it. Um, in, in my attitude, am I serving Christ in this? In my actions, so not, not only how am I doing it, but what am I doing? Uh, in, in, in the work that I do, the, the actions that I perform, am I serving Christ? And in my reactions. And this is the area where I, I feel the most conviction uh, because um, so often, instead of following the, the golden rule of, of treating people the way I want to be treated, I am a reactor so often where uh, the attitude that is brought to me is the one that I reflect back. And that's not what I'm called to do. As a Christian, I am called to uh, reflect Christ in my interactions with people. And that means that when I react to people, if they're coming to me uh, with, with, while being harsh or unkind or uh, uh, untruthful or whatever, whatever way that they're coming to me, I need in my reactions to them to consider that I should be serving Christ even in my reactions. And then as uh, leaders, uh, and all of us are leaders in some sphere, no matter who we are, someone is looking up to us. Uh, perhaps it's our children, perhaps it's uh, the kids in the neighborhood, uh, perhaps it's our employees, perhaps it's uh, our extended family, perhaps it's our neighbors, whoever it is, all of us have some sphere of leadership. And in that sphere, I need to be asking as a Christian, am I serving Christ in my leading? As I lead others, as I uh, exert authority over others, am I serving Christ? in my attitude and what I'm in how I am doing things, in my actions and what I am doing, and in my reactions and how I respond to the people who are around me. In Matthew chapter eight, verses five and following, there's a very interesting uh, account in scripture where uh, a, a leader of troops is interacting with Jesus and asking Jesus to uh, perform a miracle uh, in his household. And Jesus responds by saying, let me, let me come uh, and, and help you. And this man says, Lord, I'm not worthy of you coming to my house. I am a man under authority myself. And I know that when I tell a soldier to go and do, they go and do. So I know that you are a, a person of authority. And if you say for this to be done, it will be done. And, and Jesus responds by saying, it is amazing to see this man's faith. Um, but what we see in this passage is the, the reflection that if we are able to be under authority well, generally what happens is we are able to be in authority well. So if we're suffering or, or not serving Christ well in our attitudes, actions, and reactions while we're leading others, what we need to do is we need to remember that we are under authority as well, that we are the ones that are called to be serving as well. 
Paul in Ephesians chapter 6 here has said, do the same for them. Masters, do the same as the, the servants are doing. Um, serve sincerely and recognize that God will bring the reward for the service that we offer. I hope that you'll join me as we uh, consider uh, in our lives how to apply a passage that seems at first so um, obscure to us. When we read about slaves and masters, I think often uh, it's our initial reaction to think that we can just read through this very quickly. Um, but I would invite us uh, to see how the Lord might apply this passage to our personal life. Father, God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have even included passages that uh, at first glance are uh, difficult. I thank you that elsewhere in scripture, there are passages that are um, difficult, Lord. They're hard. They're, they demand our attention and our study. I thank you that you have made clear and plain exactly what needs to happen for us to come to you and receive the salvation that you bought and paid for. But I thank you that you have called us into a life that we can give ourselves to and never finish becoming who you've called us to be. Lord, as believers, as followers of Jesus Christ, would you help us to serve you well? God, would you make my attitude more Christ-like, more patient and kind and help me to be willing to take the first step in my interactions with those around me? God, in my actions, would you help me to be uh, a man of action? Would you help us to be a people of action who live out these truths in your word uh, in our dealings with the people around us. And in our reactions, Lord, would you help us uh, to be so in tune with you as our master that when we are uh, faced with um, difficulties and uh, harsh realities, that instead of reflecting that back to them, we reflect you instead. Lord, would you help us to become the best bond servants of you that we may be? And through our service given to you sincerely, would you help to bring those around us who need you to you? In Jesus' name, amen.